There are people who are going hungry all over the United States. It's happening in every community. It might even be your next door neighbor. Most of the people that we poll don't have enough savings to keep them beyond three months. If we were to convert the entire U.S. grain harvest into fuel for cars, it would cover only 16% of our fuel needs. So it's not a solution. In trying to reduce our oil insecurity, we're in the process of creating global food insecurity on an unprecedented scale. The fence is a band-aid. The problem is broken immigration reform. I mean, if the pipe's broken, fix the pipe. Instead of fixing the pipe, we send in more mops. Let's solve the problem. Let's don't do something cosmetic that we know will not work. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. The lyrics of the old song go, the corn's as high as an elephant's eye and will climb clear up to the sky. Good evening from what will soon be a bountiful harvest here in Southern Connecticut. The price this corn will fetch is up, way up. And while that's good news for farmers all across the country, it's bad news for anyone who's been to the supermarket lately. Later in our program, we'll give you a look at one reason for corn's steep rise. But first, we look at what rising food prices mean in two very different places. We begin not far from here, in one of the wealthiest places on earth, New York City. There, hidden from the glitz of Broadway and the wealth of Wall Street, three million, that's right, three million New Yorkers are struggling to feed themselves in what has always been our land of plenty. These days, you might view the Big Apple as a tale of two cities. Here, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, one of the country's wealthiest neighborhoods, well-to-do families drop hundreds of dollars on four-course meals at five-star restaurants. But just a stone's throw farther north, a different picture emerges. This is East Harlem, and it's home to the Yorkville Common Pantry. And the lines here have never been so long. Rising food prices have driven thousands of area residents here for the first time. The volunteers are bagging it up so that we can give it out to our families today. To Yorkville Pantry's what? director, Daniel Reyes, hears their stories every day. There really is, uh, you know, a food crisis. That it, it, it is a reality in this country. You use the word crisis. Overstatement? Uh, I don't think so. It's just amazing for, you know, for folks who used to be able to afford a gallon of milk and now just they're lucky if they can get themselves a quart, you know, and make that last. In New York City, rents have been rising, and the cost of groceries over the past 12 months has increased by nearly 7%. For some basic foods, such as milk, even more. For people living on the margins, these cost of living increases are the difference between feeding themselves and having to come to a place like this. Well, you must go to supermarkets yourself and see the prices. Yes, from my own experience, just having to, you know, wanting to spend 20 bucks and it turns out to be $40, you know, it's just crazy. And if, if I'm hurting, you can imagine what a family of, of five living off of $15,000 a year is experiencing. Rebecca Williams, Ines Alvarado. We met up with Sonia Asuncio, a single mother of four who has relied on the pantry for the past six months. What's the toughest thing for you to make? Toughest pill you have trouble meeting? Um, the food. The food is the toughest. Well, the price of food's going up quite a bit. Yes, a great deal. I mean, I can go to the supermarket and spend over $200. I have to buy milk, bread, eggs. I mean, they're growing kids, they eat. Mm -hmm. Especially the boys. Asuncio says she's worked since she was 13. But two years ago, a back injury left her disabled. At first, she was able to get by on disability checks, but as food prices started going up, the checks just weren't enough. Well, how do you make it? Um, it's not easy, but what are my choices? Do I, I let my children go hungry, or do I, you know, tell my pride bye-bye and come here and sit here and wait until my name is called and I get some food? 
you tell your pride bye bye. Is that yes. an issue with you? Yes, it is because I've always been able to do things. You know, I've always worked. I've supplied for my family, and to find myself in a situation where I feel helpless, it's very difficult. It's, it's difficult for my children to see me like that. Understand? I'm sorry. <laughs> you shouldn't feel embarrassed about coming here at all. No, it's not so much embarrassment. It's the uh, hardship. You know, when you're used to doing all the time and you, everyone comes to you and all of a sudden you have to break down and ask for help, it's tough. Prices keep going up, gas, everything, and people can't afford anything. What's going to happen 10 years from now? If I can't make it now, what happens later on? Thank you so much. Every family, like the Essencios, is guaranteed to leave here with a bag of groceries that will last them three days. This year, the pantry will provide food for 1.7 million meals. That's 300,000 more than in 2007. You know, put them in small bags. Director Reyes says meeting the need has pushed up the Yorkville pantry's cost by 30 percent, and New York City has 650 pantries just like Yorkville. Rising costs have forced a lot of them to turn people away. But Yorkville takes a different approach. To offset costs, the pantry now gives less food to each household. Have a nice day. Even if it's down to the bare bones, we still have something we can provide. And so it's milk maybe once a month, you know, fresh produce once a month if we can. Making sure that we can accommodate everybody. Accommodating people like Larry Dudley. He's a veteran of the first Gulf War. And even a smaller bag of groceries is a lifesaver for his family. It's a miracle, I mean, it's, it's a blessing. Because if it wasn't for a place like this, then a lot of us would be out here starving. A lot of people would probably be out in the street trying to feed their families and be robbing, stealing. See what I'm saying? Nina Sally worked for the city of New York for 22 years until she became disabled. Your income is Today is her first visit to the pantry. Was that a big decision for you? No, it wasn't a big decision, especially when your cabinet <coughs> is empty. Is the rise in food prices what finally got you here? Yeah. Milk and, and the eggs, uh, everything, you know. And meat, <laughs> forget it. Sometimes it's like beans and, and it's rice, you know, for a day or two. This is our new reality. I don't think any of us can see this changing anytime soon. Um, so I think it's, it's important to understand that um, the emergency feeding system in this country is being stretched to its limits and um, we, we, we just can't turn a blind eye to it. To understand how stretched they are, you have to come here to the food bank of New York City. All right. This is the warehouse that supplies all of New York City's pantries yep. and it's a massive operation. The Food Bank of New York City provides over 200,000 meals to New Yorkers each day. But there are signs that these numbers are growing, along with higher food prices. According to the Food Bank's annual hunger poll, it's estimated that the number of people struggling to afford food in New York City has jumped to 3.1 million. That's a 55% increase from their poll five years ago, and about one-third of the city's total population. So three million people are not going to the food pantry necessarily, but they're saying it sometime over the last year, maybe more than one time, I've trouble struggling, yes. struggling to meet the struggling. food. Dr. Lucy Cabrera is president and CEO of the food bank. This is America. It's a cornucopia of food production mm -hmm. and overall on the main, a wealthy country. Seems to me, and I think it'll seem to a lot of people, if you need more cereal, we'll get you more cereal. But you're telling me that there are people going hungry in New York. There, there are people who are going hungry all over the country, all over the United States. It's happening in every community. It might even be your next door neighbor. And that's what our poll brought out too. We're about three paychecks and that's it. Most of the people that we poll don't have enough savings to keep them beyond three months. Food banks from coast to coast are all having trouble meeting the new demand. Donations that form the basis of their supply are down and their costs are up. Not enough food is coming in. Dr. Cabrera took us on a tour of the food bank's warehouse in the Bronx, 
and it was obvious something, a lot of something, was missing. As we walk along here, there are a lot of empty shelves. Yes, a lot of empty shelves, something we've been experiencing for the first time this year over the last 12 months. And we're just seeing on a national level a decrease of food donations coming through the system. Our 7,000 square feet of cooler space, see how empty it is? There are a number of factors contributing to the decline in donations. It's not that much surplus anymore. In past years, commercial food distributors would donate their surplus to the food bank. But now, they can sell what was surplus to discount stores and markets overseas. At the same time, the funding food banks receive from the government, city, state, and federal, has remained stagnant for the past five years. What we're seeing is the same amount of dollars coming into the city or being spent by the city to provide free food to these programs, but is buying less food because the food is more expensive. So agencies are being forced to make tough decisions. They are saying, all right, I know I serve uh, 200 families a day in a food pantry, but now I'm seeing 250. So what, what do I do? I turn away the 50 or I put less food in the bag for the 200? And to someone who might be saying, wait a minute, between food stamps and school, breakfast and lunch programs, maybe not easily, but a family should be able to make it. Tell me what the reality is. The reality is that with all the other expenses, it's not enough. Especially if you're talking about a family that's making $7.15 an hour, or even $12 an hour, or even $15 an hour. You talk about a family of four. You know, what could they possibly make to keep the family of four going? $20,000, $25,000 a year, maybe? Still keeps you in the poverty level. It's still poverty. And Dr. Cabrera says it's no longer just those living on the lowest economic rungs that are struggling. Soaring food prices have driven even middle class families to seek food charities. We're seeing more families who would never have believed a year ago that they would be in the situation of having to go to a food pantry for a shopping bag full of food. We're actually seeing a growth in college-educated individuals going to food pantries and so forth. You grew up here, did you not? Yes, born and raised in New York City. But you've traveled, and you know the picture most people have in New York City, and it is in many ways an accurate picture. This is one of the richest, one of the wealthiest cities, not just in our country, but in the world. Yes, it is. And while everybody expects, yeah, there'll be some hungry people, nobody expects New York City mm. to have as many hungry people as it has. And the same with other urban places, because we, we don't see hunger the way we see it in Africa or in a third world countries that we're used to seeing the visuals on TV. People actually starving because there is no food. In this country, we have lots of food. There's food all over the place. There's just, there are people who can't afford and don't have access to that food. That's the story in one of the richest countries in the world. But we wanted to see the story in one of the poorest. Lesotho is a small mountainous nation in southern Africa. Here, over half the population lives on less than $2 a day. And the price of staple foods has shot up over 50% in the last year, which has led more people to the brink of starvation. Prices of things like uh, cereals and uh, pulses, beans, uh, have never been as high. Prices Amir Abdullah is all too aware of what's happening with food prices. He is regional director of the United Nations World Food Program for Southern Africa. If the prices go up, then you can only deliver less food. And I think that remains a real primary concern to, to, to the World Food Program. And you actually have to then use what food you have for the most vulnerable populations. And you really switch into a mode of just life-saving type uh, food distributions. James Bedell oversees distribution efforts for the World Food Program in Lesotho, where the challenges can appear insurmountable. If you look at all of the indicators that look so gray, you wonder as a person, how are these people surviving? 
you have maybe 500,000 people in need and we have only resources for 250,000. Sometimes it becomes challenging, you know. The fate of people lie in your hands, you know. You say, okay, you are not going to get because I've, I've assessed you. Even though you are vulnerable, but you are less vulnerable than this person. At this distribution center, many will leave empty-handed. But today, Mathalong Moeti is among the lucky ones. At one time, she was able to live off her land, but soil erosion and recent periods of drought have left her family of six without any food. The packages the World Food Program provides consist of cornmeal, lentils, and vegetable oil. This food will need to last Moeti and her family for the next month. According to the World Bank, worldwide rising food and fuel prices have now pushed 100 million new people into poverty. That has led to instability in many countries, with food riots in dozens of nations, including Haiti, India, and Mexico. When the food supply gets short, when our availability to help people is limited, we are duty-bound to go for the life-saving situations. It's not wrong that we do that, but it's perhaps wrong that the international community and ourselves are unable to help those who are not an immediately life-threatening situation, but basically, unless we do something about it, they will just go into a downward spiral. And though these emergency food distributions do save lives, they are just a temporary fix. The UN believes that rising food prices in the last year have set back economic gains made in developing countries by seven years. And a report just released by CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, states that the global food crisis is hitting the world's poor on an unprecedented scale. Currently, Lesotho gets most of its grain from South Africa. South Africa is the breadbasket for the region. When we return, we report to you how South Africa's push for energy independence could drive the price of its crops even higher. So stay here with us. At least part of the reason that corn has suddenly turned into gold for American farmers is because a lot of it is headed for gas tanks as ethanol. The United States is betting big on ethanol. There have been dozens of new ethanol refineries built here in the last year alone. And it's not just in the U.S. Ethanol and the promise of getting rich from grain is enticing farmers all over the world. But there are increasing worries that corn as fuel is also playing a substantial role in the dramatic rise in food prices that's now gone global, a rise that can mean the ability to eat or not. Around the world, cornfields have always been seen as sources of food. But now, increasingly, they're seen as a source of fuel. With the boom in corn-based ethanol, these golden kernels are attracting financiers looking for a golden investment. The United States harvests more corn than any other country on Earth, and about a quarter of it now goes to ethanol. So ethanol investors are looking for new sources of corn. One place they're targeting is South Africa. This country is one of the world's largest producers of corn. But here, unlike the United States, there's a major question of food versus fuel. South Africa feeds much of the African continent. Here, corn is known as maize, and most of it is used as food. But corn farmers, like Hannes Hasbroek, want to change that. They see a new market for their corn and a new opportunity to earn a better living. 
in the US, uh, the big ethanol boom is going on and there's uh, all the farmers, well, a lot of farmers produce maize for ethanol production and eth ethanol pro production in the world is a big thing now. We went to the US to see how they do it in the US with the ethanol and make plans to start an ethanol plant here in South Africa. But for ethanol to go big time, the corn growers need government support. And that's where eager investors have stepped in to lobby for subsidies and mandates for blending oil with ethanol. Their biggest sell is that they have a homegrown fuel for a country that relies on imported oil and coal for its energy. We would rather invest in South Africa Incorporated rather than be paying for somebody else's liquid fuels. Andrew Macanetti is president of the Southern African Biofuels Association. They see ethanol as a cure-all for Africa's energy and economic needs. What is in the net interest of a country? To build an oil refinery where you're importing liquid fuels from the Middle East or to begin to supply your own fuel needs or your own energy needs using your own resources, using your own skills and creating job opportunities in your own country. To us, you know, it's a zero-sum equation. But that's an equation that doesn't add up, even for some advocates of renewable energy, who think South Africa can't afford to divert its food to fuel. People see biofuels as being totally innocent, uh, and ecologically friendly, socially beneficial products and that this is actually the answer that we've been looking for. And it, that's just simply not the case. Annie Sugru is a United Nations advisor on biofuels in sub-Saharan Africa. As intrigued as I am with biofuels and as excited as I am for the potential for Africa, I think we need to take it very slowly. If we have a very aggressive maize to ethanol program, which uses a lot of the surplus maize, plus even maize that is used for food production, then our rural pool will be the losers because food prices will continue to increase. In South Africa, like in many areas of the world, corn is the staple, but the price has dramatically increased. A great concern for the rural poor, many who earn less than $10 a day and already spend nearly half their income on food. Alvi, a cashier at this supermarket outside Johannesburg, is seeing longtime customers no longer able to afford her products. We are not selling like before. Before it was too busy, but now it's not busy because prices are going up always. It makes a difference and our business becomes slowly because people are running because of, yeah, because of the price. And that's a big dilemma faced by South Africa's government. A choice between investing in renewable fuels and energy independence, or its obligation to protect the nation's food supply. The question was, are we doing it for the motorists? Are we doing it for climate? Are we doing it for, for the poor in South Africa? It's the job of Lan La Gometti to ask these questions. He's in the government's Department of Minerals and Energy and is in charge of advising Parliament on what support, if any, the government should provide for ethanol. How do we make sure that we don't get a diversion of maize which is destined for the food sector away from the food sector into the fuel sector? So that's food security. How do you also make sure that by creating this market you don't create a bigger demand than what can be supplied and therefore raising the price? And in the end, that's the argument that won out. In December, South Africa shocked the world when it became the first major corn producer to say no to ethanol. No mandates for oil companies. No government subsidies for corn farmers. If corn farmers wanted to produce ethanol, they were on their own. And it's not just South Africa that's beginning to have second thoughts. China which previously invested heavily in turning corn into ethanol, placed a moratorium on any new corn ethanol plants over worries about their own food security. India's prime minister said his country would not support grain-based ethanol. And in Britain, where the government has already set mandates for biofuels, 
A recent report raised concerns over food prices and greenhouse gas emissions, forcing the government to slow its ethanol program. And United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has said that he's very concerned over the effects of ethanol on food prices around the world. The UN's own reports show that biofuels were responsible for over half the increase in world grain use from 2005 to 2007, which it says has contributed to a 40% jump in worldwide food prices in the last year. As many nations begin to question the turning of food into fuel, ethanol is still a popular talking point for politicians in America. Presidential candidate Barack Obama supports government subsidies for ethanol, while John McCain, though also in favor of ethanol, adds that he wants to see the industry stand on its own without government payments. And in the last energy bill, the U.S. Congress agreed with the Bush administration that ethanol should play a major role in America's future. But for now, ethanol means corn. And that makes sense, given that the United States produces 70% of the world's corn supply. And proponents claim that with America's abundance of this golden grain, ethanol is no threat to food security. But I think if, if we really want to look at the root causes, those underlying causes of hunger, uh, it's clear that it, it's not that we're turning three billion bushels, you know, 25% of the U.S. corn crop into ethanol. That's not what's causing people to go hungry in this world. It, it simply isn't. Brian Jennings is executive vice president of the American Coalition for Ethanol, the nation's largest ethanol lobby group based in South Dakota. There are a lot of things that, that are wrong with, with hunger and, and the distribution problems we have and, and probably trade policy that, that causes food prices um, to hurt developing countries. But to pin the ethanol industry's use of one-fourth of the U.S. corn crop on that, I think is entirely unjustified. Higher food prices are certainly also due to other factors, such as increasing demand for Western meat-based diets from China and India. But Jennings says there is a smoking gun here, though he says it's oil, not ethanol, that is the culprit. High oil prices make it more expensive for farmers to plant, to harvest, and to haul their crops. High energy costs make it more expensive for food processors to process, to package, to market, and to distribute food. And so I would say the primary culprit here is the fact that energy costs are high. Demand from around the globe, including from developing countries, some weather-related disasters that have driven up the price of crops, and ethanol's demand for corn. If you look at that entire package, I think that's what you're seeing taking place at the retail level today in the grocery store. However, these factors are largely outside the control of individual governments. That's not the case for biofuels policy, and that's why critics of America's ethanol industry think the U.S. should follow South Africa's lead. We sat down with critic Lester Brown of the Earth Policy Institute, a Washington-based environmental think tank, to hear his perspective on the food versus fuel debate. The grain required to fill a 25-gallon SUV tank with ethanol will feed one person for a year. Or if we were to convert the entire U.S. grain harvest into fuel for cars, it would cover only 16% of our fuel needs. So it's not a solution. Um, and at some point, um, Washington is going to have to realize that not only is it not a solution, but in trying to reduce our, our oil insecurity, we're in the process of creating global food insecurity on an unprecedented scale, and on a scale that could be enormously costly and disruptive. And Brown notes, the price of corn has nearly quadrupled since 2005. The corn growers like to say, well, we don't eat much corn. That's true. But if you open your refrigerator door, 
Uh, you see milk and eggs and cheese and chicken and pork and beef and yogurt and ice cream. These are all corn products. Our refrigerators are stuffed with corn. What happens to the price of corn is going to directly affect the price of every one of these products. And it has. The price of wheat has doubled in the past two years, while dairy and meat are also on the rise due to the increased cost of animal feed. And some experts predict prices will continue to rise. Ethanol is expected to eat up 40% of the U.S. corn crop within the next four years, with over 70 new ethanol plants under construction. By the end of 2008, if all these plants under construction are completed, and there's no reason to think they, they won't be, then we'll need twice as much corn, uh, nearly a third of our total grain crop going into ethanol distilleries. Well, that raises the question, then why not increase the production of corn, plant more corn? Would that solve the problem? Well, the problem is we have sort of a fixed amount of land now. And if you plant more corn, you plant less soybeans, and that's what happened this year. And so soybean prices have been trading over $10 a bushel. Traditionally, we've been a great corn exporter. You can't foresee the time when we're importers of corn. Well, there's not really much of anyone to import corn from. The U.S. corn crop is, is an extraordinary achievement in a sense, and most people don't realize how important it is. Corn is now the world's most important grain. Just to put that in perspective, the corn harvest in Iowa, which is usually our leading corn-producing state, is larger than the total grain harvest of Canada. Iowa, however, if it, given the number of distilleries now in, in operation there, and the ones under construction in the planning stages, if they're all completed, Iowa will be an importing state. Why should I care about it? Why should anyone care? I think most of us and most of the people who are watching this program are reasonably well fed. But there are a lot of people in the world who are barely surviving, and rising prices for them could create political instability in cities on a scale that we've not seen before. If even a fraction of what you've talked about comes to fruition, increased starvation, instability. You're an academic, not a minister. What are our moral obligations here? Throughout human history, each generation has assumed responsibility for what it leaves the next generation. Um, they don't always do a good job, but at least there's that sense of responsibility. When I was in the U.S. Department of Agriculture 45 years ago, maintaining food security was fairly simple. If there was a poor harvest somewhere in the world and food supplies began to tighten, we'd just bring back some of our idled cropland. And now, suddenly, there's so many things at work. What about the argument that goes along these lines? The argument goes, listen, market forces will take care of this. There'll be ups and downs, there'll be peaks and valleys, but the market forces will take care of all of these problems. You believe it? Should I believe it? The market will take care of the problems. And one of the things it will do is reduce world population in order to balance the food supply and demand. The market's very efficient, and it'll take care of all the problems. It'll solve all the problems. The question is, are those solutions acceptable to us? Agricultural economist Lester Brown. Now, when we come back in a moment, we'll have another story on security. This one from down on the border. So stick in here with us. And now, from corn to down on the border. We've all heard the expression used out on the farm from poet Robert Frost, that good fences make good neighbors. But on the Texas border with Mexico, there's a town where the mayor thinks a fence walling off his community from Mexico is a bad idea that will waste millions of tax dollars and do little to stop illegal immigration. Tiny Eagle Pass, Texas, has suddenly become a thorn in the side of the Department of Homeland Security. We have some uh, irate citizens in the interior of the United States that really don't understand the issues. Uh, they not, they're not familiar with the Texas border. 
Chad Foster is the mayor of Eagle Pass, Texas, the heart of water country, where sombreros mingle with Stetsons. And there's no clear line between languages, names, or what's for dinner. Foster's sleepy town of just over 20,000 is on the front lines of a bitter national debate because it is fighting the construction of a border fence within its city limits. The mayor says he's been getting hate mail from all over the United States, some even saying that he's a Mexican narco-trafficker. Why don't I move to Mexico? Uh, I must be a narco-traficante. And that's not the issue. We're Americans living on the border, and we know the border. And on the border here in Eagle Pass, everyone we spoke to seemed to oppose the construction of a fence to keep out undocumented immigrants. Are our congressmen and senators going to come down here and repair that fence? Because they are going to tear it up. I mean, we really ought to ask Chinese. They built a wall one time. But they'd have to have somebody out there every day to maintain it in a week's time if they don't. It's going to have, you know, you don't have a billion dollar fence that's all tore up. But for now, Uncle Sam has other plans. In January, the federal government sued to make Eagle Pass cooperate with government advance teams coming to survey the city's downtown Shelby Park on the banks of the Rio Grande. That's where they're preparing to build the Black Steel Barrier. Ana Maria Herrera has lived in Eagle Pass all her life. I don't quite understand why it's going to go through the middle of Shelby Park when it is being used for recreational purposes. Then first base is going to be on this side of the fence, second base on the other side. So are we going to have a little immigration station in between? Just above the baseball diamond in Shelby Park, there's a bridge that connects Eagle Pass to its sister city across the Rio Grande, Piedras Negras. <laughs> There, in March, the two towns kicked off their annual Friendship Festival with a ceremony known as the Abrazo, or Embrace. The tradition of the Abrazo de la Amistad has been part of the festivities of the International Friendship Festival for many years. There's no better sample of what the Texas border is like than what we see and what we enjoy on a daily basis in our friends and neighbors in Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass. It's straight through this land that Congress told the Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, to build the fence. I mean, they have feelings, we have feelings, but we have not had yet something that serious to want to put a fence. President Reagan speaking to President Gorbachev, take down this wall, and here we are in the United States erecting physical barriers between our neighbors, that does not make for good neighbors. Uh, Piedras Negras, we grew up together. I'm in Piedras Negras at least once a day. We have friends in Piedras, we socialize Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras even though we're two countries, uh, we operate as one community, we have a wonderful relationship. Piedras Negras and Eagle Pass, we see it here like it's another neighborhood, even though that we are very much aware that they, we have the border, we have the Rio Grande, and it's another country but we have grown up together. There's a religion that baptizes their members in the river. How will they continue doing that? Ms. Herrera also said that feelings of solidarity extend to real help in times of crisis. In 2006, a tornado ripped a swath of destruction across Texas and the Mexican state of Coahuila, of which Piedras Negras is the fourth largest city. We had two elementary schools completely demolished. The following day, the governor of Coahuila was in Piedras Negras, and he came to this site. And I believe that makes the, our ties stronger as a huge family. Same thing with our trade. We depend very strongly on the people from Mexico that do their shopping here. And I believe that it would affect the flea market that we have above here. The fence was never intended to be one continuous barrier all along the Mexican border. The Secure Fence Act of 2006 authorized the construction of fencing along just 700 of our 2,100 miles of shared frontier, mostly around official border stations like the one in Eagle Pass. And because of floodplains and enforcement concerns, it's hard to build right on the Rio Grande. So, the proposed fence winds its way through border communities, 
54% on private land, dividing backyards, ranches, and Eagle Pass's Shelby Park. Even the University of Texas at Brownsville, where this yellow line represents the proposed fence line. But things didn't start out as hostile as they've become between Eagle Pass and the federal government. In June of 2006, the Department of Homeland Security presented to the City Council an extensive plan for improving border security in the area. The city welcomed many of the ideas, just not the fence part. And in their project, or in their presentation, they wanted to overlay a road uh, over a cart path that parallels a river to support their vehicles, uh, which is a wonderful idea. It'll keep them off our sprinkler system. Uh, then they wanted to install 15 light towers about approximately a quarter mile off the river to illuminate our golf course and our city park at night, and that's a great idea. It'll be a tremendous aesthetic improvement. After months of back and forth, says Mayor Foster, DHS agreed to the border security project without the fence. He provided us with this copy of City Council Minutes from 2007 in which a DHS officer proposes a compromise plan in which he says the erection of the fence has been deleted. That's why, by Foster's account, the condemnation lawsuit caught the town so off guard. I was at City Hall, uh, oblivious to any lawsuit. Uh, I believe the first call was from CNN, asked me what I thought about, a law, about the lawsuit that had been filed against the city of Eagle Pass by DHS, and I told them I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. At that time, I asked our city attorneys, who had been working with lawyers in DHS, you know, what's, what's the issue? And they made the comment there, they, they assumed that the issue was the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. The Department of Homeland Security says their decision-making process about where to put the fence is classified. In a letter, they told us that the fence in Shelby Park is part of an overall strategy to keep undocumented immigrants from, quote, filtering into the communities. We are not proposing a solid steel wall separating communities, they write. DHS points out that the fence will include gates for access to the fenced-off portions of the park. Mayor Foster says the impact on Eagle Pass is still far too high. It cuts our water intake from the river off. We won't be able to maintain it. We'll have challenges to access it. And then it goes through a residential subdivision that's been platted but still hadn't been built out. Now the developer will either have to resize his lodge or now he'll have to reconfigure his whole development to meet uh, the requirements to how we're going to take care of this fence. Will his, will his neighbors need a passport to go from one side of the fence to the other to their home? Right now, the uh, Texas border, the Arizona border, the New Mexico border are still basically wide open. We need to build the border fence. It's now the law. Congressman Duncan Hunter of California co-sponsored the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Although 100 miles have already been built, the law mandates 700. Where Mayor Foster sees a government obsessed, Hunter feels that DHS is dragging its feet, and he blames the president, a Texas rancher. They've gone very slowly, and I think it's clear that the, the president does not like the idea of a border fence, uh, but I think it's a, a very, very critical issue for this country, especially after 9-11. And, and let me give you one statistic that I think is very telling. This last year, we had over 80,000 people who came across the border illegally from Mexico who were not citizens of Mexico. Some of them came from communist China. Uh, some of them came from, uh, from countries who we consider to be adversarial, uh, countries that fund terrorist activities. And someday, those same smugglers that, get, that take $10,000 a load for narcotics to bring to smuggle into the U.S., they take $10,000 a load to smuggle illegal aliens into the U.S., one day they'll take $10,000 a load to smuggle explosive into the United States to be used against American citizens in a terrorist act. But opponents of the fence point out that half of illegal aliens, including all the 9-11 hijackers, come to the U.S. legally, for example, on commercial air flights. Then they simply overstay their visas. Mayor Foster. The Government Accountability Office and their report to Congress made the fact known that the ports of entry, both northern and southern, are underfunded by $4.8 billion and understaffed by 4,000 agents. If we're ramping up to secure our borders, why are we underfunding them? The known terrorists that have come into the United States came across ports of entry, not between the ports. 
the majority of the drug traffic comes across ports of entry, not between the ports. Yet in President Bush's new budget proposal, he's cutting $344 million off the port of entry funding. But a need to focus on other borders isn't an argument for ignoring the Rio Grande. The question is, is a fence the most effective safeguard? In the mid-1990s, Duncan Hunter had a fence built near his home district in San Diego. This is the area between San Diego and Tijuana before we built my double border fence. And we had gangs roaming this land. You had people lining up in military formations and overrunning the border patrol as soon as it got dark. Each one of these ravines had crimes taking place as the border gangs waited to rob and rape and murder people coming across illegally. After I built the double border fence, this is what it looked like. We cut back the smuggling of drugs and narcotics and people by more than 90 percent. So if you take all the good things that happened in San Diego as a result of the fence, I think you can fairly well expect that those same salutary results would occur when we build the fence in the other areas. As we speak, we found 42 tunnels under, under physical barriers on the southern border. Mayor Foster is of a different opinion. The fence is a band-aid. The problem is broken immigration reform. And then you compare it to a kitchen sink. I mean, if the pipe's broken, fix the pipe. Instead of fixing the pipe, we send in more mops. Let's solve the problem. Let's don't do something cosmetic that we know will not work. Illegal immigration did fall sharply in San Diego after Hunter's fence was built. However, it simultaneously rose sharply in Arizona. And now, as enforcement improves in Arizona, it's creeping back up in San Diego. Total apprehensions of undocumented immigrants along the southern border have continued at the same level, about a million and a quarter per year over the past decade. The more things change, the more they stay the same, say locals, and that injects a dose of skepticism into their opinions about the government's latest plan. I have heard about the federal government's project to build a physical fence down the river in hopes of keeping the illegals from coming into the United States. And after studying it and looking at what it's going to cost, and how effective it would be, I have to tell you, it's a stupid idea because the fence isn't going to keep anybody out. Brian O'Brien is a cattle rancher who lives in El Andio, Texas, just southeast of Eagle Pass. The Rio Grande is in his backyard. He feels that building a fence is not the most efficient use of DHS's money. Instead, he thinks they should take better advantage of border security technology already in place. Well, the government has a lot of equipment down here now. There's two TV cameras up north that monitors the river. There's a balloon, it's, I don't see it up today, but it's generally right there. It's supposed to monitor the river. We have border patrol on us 24 hours a day, riding around in vehicles looking for illegals. No, I don't like the idea, but the reason I don't like the idea because the federal government's talking about spending 40 billion billion with a B to build a fence, and it isn't going to work. You know, they swim the river, they climb the fence. I don't care if it's 20 foot high. It's just a total waste of money. It sounds good. It sounds good in Washington. But I think if they'd come down here and investigate it, it just wouldn't work. We're standing right on a stake here where the proposed fence is to be placed, uh, splitting our property in two, leaving 30 acres um, uh, on the unsecure side or on the River Vega side and 37 acres um, on the high bank uh, on the safe side. Tony Sufuentes is a land developer in Eagle Pass. His plan to build a 170-home residential subdivision on his land is at a standstill. We were going to start our uh, proposed development in uh, two th early 2007, uh, just when we received notice uh, from Homeland Security that they were uh, thinking about uh, putting up a border wall uh, that was going to run uh, right down the middle of our property. We, we were informed uh, a few weeks ago that uh, uh, they'd be staking the property 
and they did, but we have not heard anything since then. The problem that I see here is, is that what are we going to do with these 30 acres? This was going to be a 30-acre park with the amenities, boat docks, tracks, fields, baseball fields, soccer fields, you name it. Um, the biggest park in, in the county. Um, and um, I'm not so sure we're going to go through with that now. It's absurd, he says, to build a fence that starts and stops at seemingly random points. You can't allow a, an individual landowner to determine what the immigration policy of the United States is going to be. So a guy who owns land on the border does not have the right to say, today I'm going to let the Iranian come in, but I'm not going to let the North Korean come in. I'm going to let this guy from Guatemala come in because he's going to work on this ranch, but I'm not going to let this guy from China come in. You can't let an individual landowner determine the immigration policy of the United States of America. You know, if you'd ask him to call Chad Foster at the office, the tenacious opposition of Eagle Pass Mayor Foster in particular has riled lawmakers. Some think that DHS needs to get more aggressive with him. Republican Representative Mark Souter of Indiana. I heard the mayor of Eagle Pass on a San Antonio radio station whining away about us putting a fence on top of, we've already moved it back from the, the golf course. We've already gone to a decorative fence. We've already built him a park and he's still holding it up. Well, let's talk about this whining. Uh, I take offense. Uh, I'd like to meet the representative myself and discuss the, the definition of whining. Uh, I, I'd invite him down. I would think it very improbable that he has ever seen the Rio Grande River and next to impossible that he's ever been to the city of Eagle Pass. We've had one murder in the last 10 years. We're not proud about that murder, but we don't perceive ourselves to be anything but safe. We have developments that go up to the riverbanks. We live very safely on the Texas border. So I would, I would take issue with we don't know what's good for us. I don't know anything about the southern border of California. And I would think that uh, Mr. Hunter knows very little about the Texas border. Congressman Hunter, for his part, doesn't see why a fence would deter legitimate exchange between the two countries. Now, you know, if folks want to come in, we have the biggest front door in the world in this country. You knock on the front door present your credentials, and come on in. But for him, that's a secondary concern. I think it's clear that since 9-11, this should be non-negotiable. We need to know who's coming into our country, who's stepping across that line. We need to know what they're bringing with them. We raise our families on the border. There's no one more concerned about border security than those of us that live and raise families on the border. DHS has admitted that this fence will only slow down an illegal entry by three or four minutes, and we don't feel that's good enough for an expense as reported by the Congressional Research Service. Building and maintaining 700 miles of fence will cost American taxpayers $49 billion. Uh, historically, the Texas border and the southern border has been neglected by state and federal officials. And now we're going to get $49 billion invested in something that will do nothing more than convey a false sense of security. Since we first started looking into this story and put it on the air, the band of border towns headed by Mayor Foster has fought the government's condemnation lawsuit against them tooth and nail, saying, among other things, that the money the government is offering for their condemned land is so low as to be insulting. Meantime, the Department of Homeland Security itself has issued a report acknowledging that the fence will make life harder for ranchers, hurt wildlife, and generally interrupt life along the border. Critics call Mayor Foster stubborn, but everyone calls him effective. As fence construction streams ahead on the rest of the border, it remains stalled in Texas. And that's our program for tonight. For HDNet, this time from the cornfields of Connecticut. Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at 
viewer at hd.net. Well, how do you make it? Um, it's not easy, but what are my choices? Do I, I let my children go hungry? Or do I, you know, tell my pride bye-bye and come here and sit here and wait until my name is called and I get some food? You tell your pride bye-bye. Is that yes. an issue with you? Yes, it is, because I've always been able to do things, you know? I've always worked, I've supplied for my family, and to find myself in a situation where I feel helpless, it's very difficult. It's, it's difficult for my children to see me like that. Understand? I'm sorry. <laughs> you shouldn't feel embarrassed about coming here at all. No, it's not so much embarrassment. It's a uh, hardship. You know, when you're used to doing all the time, and you, everyone comes to you, and all of a sudden you have to break down and ask for help. It's tough. Prices keep going up, gas, everything, and people can't afford anything. What's going to happen 10 years from now? If I can't make it now, what happens later on? Thank you so much. Every family, like the Essencios, is guaranteed to leave here with a bag. The lyrics of the old song go, the corn's as high as an elephant's eye and will climb clear up to the sky. Good evening from what will soon be a bountiful harvest here in Southern Connecticut. The price this corn will fetch is up, way up. And while that's good news for farmers all across the country, it's bad news for anyone who's been to the supermarket lately. Later in our program, we'll give you a look at one reason for corn's steep rise. But first, we look at what rising food prices mean in two very different places. We begin not far from here, in one of the wealthiest places on earth, New York City. There, hidden from the glitz of Broadway and the wealth of Wall Street, three million, that's right, three million New Yorkers are struggling to feed themselves in what has always been our land of plenty. These days, you might view the Big Apple as a tale of two cities. Here, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, one of the country's wealthiest neighborhoods, well-to-do families drop hundreds of dollars on four-course meals at five-star restaurants. But just a stone's throw farther north, a different picture emerges. This is East Harlem, and it's home to the Yorkville Common Pantry. And the lines here have never been so long. Rising food prices have driven thousands of area residents here for the first time. The volunteers are bagging it up so that we can give it out to our families today. So Yorkville Pantry's what? director, Daniel Reyes, hears their stories every day. There really is, uh, you know, a food crisis. That it, it, it is a reality in this country. You use the word crisis. Overstatement? Uh, I don't think so. It's just amazing for, you know, for folks who used to be able to afford a gallon of milk and now just they're lucky if they can get themselves a quart, you know, and make that last. In New York City, rents have been rising, and the cost of groceries over the past 12 months has increased by nearly 7%. For some basic foods, such as milk, even more. For people living on the margins, these cost of living increases are the difference between feeding themselves and having to come to a place like this. Well, you must go to supermarkets yourself and see the prices. Yes, from my own experience, just having to, you know, wanting to spend 20 bucks and it turns out to be $40, you know, it's just crazy. And if, if I'm hurting, you can imagine what a family of, of five living off of $15,000 a year is experiencing. Rebecca Williams, Ines Alvarado. We met up with Sonia Asuncio, a single mother of four who has relied on the pantry for the past six months. What's the toughest thing for you to make? Toughest pill you have trouble meeting? Um, the food. The food is the toughest. Well, the price of food's gone up quite a bit. Yes, a great deal. I mean, I can go to the supermarket and spend over $200. I have to buy milk, bread, eggs. I mean, they're growing kids, they eat. <laughs> Especially the boys. Asuncio says she's worked since she was 13. But two years ago, a back injury left her disabled. At first, she was able to get by on disability checks. 
But as food prices started going up, the checks just weren't enough. There are people who are going hungry all over the United States. It's happening in every community. It might even be your next door neighbor. Most of the people that we poll don't have enough savings to keep them beyond three months. If we were to convert the entire U.S. grain harvest into fuel for cars, it would cover only 16% of our fuel needs. So it's not a solution. In trying to reduce our oil insecurity, we're in the process of creating global food insecurity on an unprecedented scale. The fence is a band-aid. The problem is broken immigration reform. I mean, if the pipe's broken, fix the pipe. Instead of fixing the pipe, we send in more mops. Let's solve the problem. Let's don't do something cosmetic that we know will not work. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports.